My name is Jerry Gill. Today is April 24th, 2007. I'm visiting with Dr. Robert Purcell on the Oklahoma State University campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This interview is for the Old State Storage Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And uh, Dr. Purcell, thank you for taking time from your busy day to stop by and visit with us. Uh, Pleasure to be here. And I want to welcome you back to Oklahoma State University. I understand it's been several years since you've been back on the campus. Several years. And uh, I also want to congratulate you on uh, the, your recognition of the College of Arts and Sciences as a distinguished alumnus of 2009. Quite an honor. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Uh, there's got to be a great story, Dr. Purcell, about how, how a small town boy from Haleyville, Oklahoma, and, then, and that, that small town, uh, can become co-chief of the Laboratory for Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, but uh, i got to ask you out of curiosity, did you ever go to Pete's Place there in Krebs, close uh, to you? I was at Pete's Place night before last. Oh, okay. Every time I come back, I go to Pete's Place, mm -hmm. one of uh, my favorite places. i got to ask you this, did you have your chalk beer? I had my chalk beer <laughs> and I had my calf fries. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're right in, you got right into the culture then. Right <laughs> That's great. Uh, can you share some memories of your family and growing up in, you know, in, in Haleyville? Yes, I, I was actually in the third grade, about nine years old, when I moved to Haleyville from uh, Dallas, Texas. My family had lived there for several years, uh, and so it was a it was quite a change from suburban Dallas to rural uh, Haleyville. Uh, but it was a it was an interesting place to grow up. My uh, mother and father were both uh, school teachers. We actually came to Oklahoma because my father um, managed a, a fishing and, and auto supply store in McAllister okay. and bought a house in, in Haleyville rather than McAllister uh, because he found something he liked there. So uh, we lived in, in Haleyville. He uh, commuted to McAllister and eventually he got back into teaching. So he taught science in Hartshorn and my mother taught English uh, in Haleyville. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had her as an English teacher, so it was a, it was a pretty good basic education with two uh, teacher parents. So I had that <coughs> influence at home, and then the, the interesting uh, characteristics of Haleyville and the surrounding area uh, to grow up with also. In a small town environment. Where small town everybody. environment, yeah. It's good and bad when because if you did something good, good everybody knew about it. If you did something everybody, bad, everybody knew about it. Everybody knew. About it. <laughs> uh, what uh, were there some values that you learned, uh, Dr. Purcell, in your life, you know, from your family that uh, that have uh, you know influenced your life since? Well, my parents were uh, Depression era people, so like many people who grew up and experienced the Depression, they they knew to be careful about money, and they knew the value of hard work, and they knew the value of honesty and and uh, responsibility, and I think. I think they taught uh, not only me but my two brothers those characteristics also. Is that your family, the three boys in your family? Yeah. I was the middle boy. My older brother was in World War II, he was in the Navy in World War II. He mm -hmm. came back then uh, to uh, Haleyville, finished high school uh, there, then went to Wilburton for two years and then up to Oklahoma State. Mm -hmm. And then I did the same mm -hmm. and my younger brother did the same. Well, that was sort of the next question where I was kind of going is what influenced you to enroll at Oklahoma State University? Was that basically because you were sort of following your brother? Or, you know? In in part that. We mm -hmm. were not a wealthy family and, and uh, uh, Eastern Oklahoma, but we were not a wealthy family. Mm -hmm. uh, school teachers mm -hmm. never got paid very, very much and so school was less expensive. We went to Wilburton and, mm -hmm. and then up here and my brother uh, so much enjoyed his training here that I naturally had to come up here also. What uh, what was your first impressions of Oklahoma State University? Had, had you been up there before since your brother had been there? I mean, when you... Well, we had come to visit mm -hmm. uh, occasionally. It seemed like a very nice uh, campus and certainly still is. Mm -hmm. well, what, what do you remember about it? What, what stood out in your mind? Well, of course, the library had just been completed uh, yeah. not long mm -hmm. uh, before that. Uh, so that was kind of the central focus. The, the um, Hotel training program was in place by then, so that was a functioning part of the campus and, and, uh, and somewhat prominent. Uh, I 
when I came up, I uh, joined the Sigma Nu fraternity, so we were just right across from Theta Pond, so mm -hmm. the campus was spread out before us. Well, did, did you have some favorite hangouts on campus and off campus, places where you went for fun, enjoyment, or recreation? Well, down the strip, just, uh, just around the corner, <laughs> I understand it's changed almost not at all in all those years. <laughs> Just wherever wherever the action was. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you remember? Where some of your classes were held on campus? What buildings? Well, I was a chemistry major, and so the chemistry uh, laboratories were in one of the infamous Quonset huts, which I understand are pretty much all gone by now. But so I spent a fair amount of time uh, in those mm -hmm. infernal buildings. <laughs> were, the, were the labs there as well? Yeah. Must have been yeah, exciting. Yeah, it was exciting. <laughs> good, good quality control in the concert, yeah, yeah, right? Good quality control. <laughs> what about your, uh, uh, Dr. Sell, your student experience? You know, organizations you're part of, uh, leadership activities. Can you share a little bit about your student experience with us? Yeah, I was pretty busy because I was taking a, a full load. I took up to 20 hours of, of classes some semesters, uh, so I, I was busy doing that. But I was a uh, President of the Arts and Sciences uh, Council one year, and that was probably the, the biggest uh, extracurricular activity that I was in, involved with. Do you remember, recall who the dean was? When you I were there? don't remember. Mm -hmm. okay. well, uh, do you remember some of your faculty advisors, some of your instructors, professors that uh, were influential to, for you? Yeah, certainly the chemistry professors. Virginia Lippert, uh, who was in charge of the chemistry laboratories, was a, I mean, she was a real mentor to me. I, I've been very uh, pleased with, uh, with my interactions with her. She was an important uh, person. Uh, Dr. Hodnett and uh, Dr. Gerber, and there were a number of, uh, of other, physicians, other um, uh, faculty members. Dr. Glass in, in biological. Uh, uh, Byron Glass. Yeah, Bi Byron Glass. He yeah. also, uh, Brian Glass was also um, an instructor for my older brother who majored in fish and wildlife, so he had a lot of contact with Dr. Glass. So you graduated in 1957 with a bachelor's degree, and your major was, was chemistry or biology? It was chemistry. It was chemistry. Yeah, my major was mm -hmm. uh, chemistry. <clears throat> Do you have some special memories? of your time at Oklahoma State University, some highlights? I remember one really frightening time we had one of those storms that you can only have in Oklahoma. <laughs> it was a, you know, I don't think anybody saw a tornado in that, in that storm, but it was a huge storm with, the, I think it was about eight inches of rain fell in about two hours. It was one of those horrendous storms. So <laughs> we were going out, my fraternity brothers and I, were going to go rescue people. There were a lot of people stranded, and so, one of them had a boat, I think, so we went off to save the world, almost drowned ourselves, <laughs> barely made it back. <laughs> well, uh, you were, uh, I think, in the, the last graduating class from Oklahoma A&M. That's and exactly you, right. Do you take pride in that? I do take pride in that. Uh, we were given the option of turning in our diplomas to get one that said Oklahoma State instead of Oklahoma A&M. I didn't do that. I said I was proud to be an Aggie for life. <laughs> what What did you What did you think about the change, the name change from Oklahoma A and to Oklahoma State, and from Aggies to Cowboys? Was that okay with you? <laughs> it was okay with me. Yeah, it was okay with me. I imagine a lot of people got upset by it. Though. There, there's some alumni that wanted, wanted to be Oklahoma. <laughs> they're still upset. <laughs> uh, well, do, do you feel like Dr. Purcell that your your background, the training? academic preparation you got at Oklahoma State University did help prepare you for graduate school and for your later career? It did. I was very pleased with the, with the training I, I got here. It was a big help. It's continued to be a help all these years. So you, you left Oklahoma State University and then went to Baylor uh, for your master's. Could, started, could you share maybe your graduate experiences here a little bit? Yeah, I started uh, medical school. I went to, to Baylor, started medical school, and took a combined program uh, which is an MD and master's degree. These were one of the one of the earlier programs. I think now many schools have combined uh, MD PhD program, but that was not common then. 
So I took advantage of that program, and uh, then after two years, uh, I transferred to Duke University, finished my master's degree, transferred to Duke University, finished my MD degree there, took a pediatric internship, and then I joined the Epidemic Intelligence Service of the CDC. Yeah. Epidemiology and or, or pediatrics. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking there's, 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 that's quite a swing, isn't it? That's quite a swing, yeah. yeah. Quite a swing. Uh, when did you, uh, when did you first realize your passion for, for medical research? Because I think I read somewhere in your biography that you really realized early on that you didn't want to be a practicing uh, physician, that you really wanted to do research. When did you first feel that passion for research? Well, I, it was interesting. When my older brother was up here at Oklahoma State, uh, Oklahoma A&M, and he would come to visit periodically. And he'd, he'd come down, he'd been taking interesting courses, and he would come down and show me something that, that he had learned. Or he, I remember once he brought down a copy of Scientific American. I'd never seen that magazine before. And I was just really excited about it. I thought, gee, this sounds like something I'd really like to do. So I got interested in science then. And um, then when I was at, uh, at Wilburton, uh, my science instructor, uh, Andre Estrada, from McAllen, Texas, um, really got me interested in chemistry. He was one of these kinds of mentors who, mm. who can really build a fire under people. So that was how I got interested in chemistry and why I majored in chemistry. So uh, why epidemiology? What, what appealed to you about that field? Well, uh, um, I was joining the Public Health Service and I decided to join it through, uh, through CDC uh, with this program that they, that they had. Epidemiology is, you know, linked to infectious diseases. I was interested in infectious diseases because pediatrics is largely infectious diseases. <laughs> A lot of it is infectious diseases. And um, so I got in that program. Most of the people in that two-year program uh, are either sent to a, a state uh, public health office or stay at the CDC for uh, epidemic uh, investigations and such. But at the time, the NIH had uh, some extra money and they were funding some positions for vaccine development. Um, and I was selected for one of those positions. So after finishing the basic epidemiology training, which is about a two-month training course at CDC, I was transferred to the NIH. And that's where I've been ever since. Now the, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, is that where you did your the, the short internship? Yeah, 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 it's called EIS, Epidemic Intelligence Service. So you learn basic epidemiology and mm -hmm. statistics and infectious diseases and all that stuff. And I guess the timing was good for you because there were just some researchers coming to the front and some of those diseases at that time. Yeah, actually the timing mm -hmm. was, was very good. It was the sort of the golden age of uh, uh, virology. Uh, tissue cultures had become uh, available and people were, were discovering new viruses all the time. So it was just a great opportunity. What uh, your, did, did any of your work with uh, the, the, the communicable diseases deal with the, through the years and up to, to the current time with bioterrorism or was your work strictly in other areas? Well, it's interesting. Uh, after 9-11, a, a big chunk of my work actually became uh, directly involved uh, with bioterrorism. As a part of our, uh, of our program on hepatitis viruses, we, did, we do studies in, in uh, animals, and the only animals that are susceptible to most of the hepatitis viruses are not human primates. And the only animal that's susceptible to all five of the hepatitis viruses is chimpanzees. So we did uh, studies for a number, in fact, we still are doing studies in, in uh, chimpanzees. And one of the things that we uh, had done was to make monoclonal antibodies um, that were specific for the hepatitis viruses uh, uh, in, in the chimpanzees because we inf infected them with the viruses to study other aspects of it. And then we could just uh, make antibodies from them um, based on, on their past experience with the viruses. And these are virtually identical to human mm -hmm. antibodies, so you can actually use them for 
therapy or for prophylaxis. So we expanded that program to make antibodies to uh, a number of the agents of concern in terms of bioterrorism. Uh, we made antibodies to smallpox virus. We made antibodies to all of the toxins of uh, the anthrax bacillus. Uh, we're making antibodies to rabies virus and to uh, a number of other agents. So that turned out to be a, a it became a fairly large problem. Was part of that work classified? Uh, Not what we were doing. That wasn't uh, classified. Mm -hmm. But many of these agents you cannot work on it. You know, in, in just any laboratory. For instance, the work on making monoclonal antibodies to smallpox required collaboration with the CDC because there are only two laboratories in the world anymore that can work on the actual smallpox virus. CDC is one and the other one is in Russia. Uh, dating back to 1963, I think, you, when you first started and went to work with the uh, Laboratory for Infectious Diseases, uh, you've had a long and distinguished career. Can you share some of the highlights of your research and things that brought you special uh, recognition in those areas? Yes. Uh, some of the first things I did when I got there had to do with epidemiology and had to do with uh, field trials of vaccines that were being developed in, in the laboratory by my mentor, uh, Robert Chanick. One was a, a vaccine against uh, uh, adenoviruses that, that cause, were causing uh, an enormous amount of illness in uh, marine recruits at uh, Paris Island, uh, South Carolina, first where they take their basic training, and then at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, they would have whole barracks of, uh, of Marines down sick mm -hmm. and, with some occasional deaths. And so my mentor, Bob Chanick, had uh, developed a way of, of uh, uh, making a live adenovirus vaccine that could be taken in a, in a, in a capsule. And whereas it normally causes uh, severe respiratory disease and in infection of the upper respiratory tract and the lungs, if you took it in a, in a capsule, uh, then it would infect your intestinal tract, but, but not, uh, wouldn't cause respiratory disease. And that worked. That was a wonderful vaccine. It completely uh, eradicated that problem in the, in the marine recruits. So that was an exciting uh, actually field study that I did. I went to Camp Lejeune and to Paris Island and, and followed the marine recruits down there in a, in a vaccine program. So that was one exciting thing. And then um, Bob Chanick wanted to start a hepatitis virus program, uh, but at the time virtually nothing was known about the hepatitis viruses. Um, there were no tests for them. It wasn't clear how many there were. It was thought based on epidemiology that there were two anyway. And uh, so to begin collecting clinical materials that we could study and try to, to find the viruses, um, we set up a prospective study in the um, heart surgery unit at, uh, at NIH. It was in the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the time. And this was also the early days of open heart surgery uh, and valve replacement. And it uh, required a lot of blood because the, the blood pumps were very primitive at the time. It took an average of 18 units of blood per operation for these individuals. And we knew that some of them developed hepatitis, but we had no idea how many. And, and so we began following them from before surgery uh, up to at least a year after surgery. And, and we found, much to our dismay, that a third of them developed hepatitis after their surgery from the blood that was contaminated and no one had any idea how contaminated the blood uh, was. And of those that got commercial blood, blood that was, was bought you know, from people who were willing to give their blood for anything, 50% uh, of them, half of them developed hepatitis. And, and so this was just unbelievable. And so over the years, uh, partly from, from that study, uh, where materials were collected and, and epidemiology of transfusion-associated hepatitis was, was better understood and from a number of, of other studies. Uh, that's no longer a problem. It's one of the great 
uh, medical success stories that most people don't really know about. Now, um, of fewer than one in two million uh, blood recipients gets hepatitis. So the ability to screen out bad blood has been a tremendous success story. So you're able to uh, check samples and detect the presence before, of yeah, before giving the blood. Mm -hmm. So now those are all gotten rid of. Oh, and great. also we don't buy blood anymore. All blood is, is uh, volunteer blood now. That also got way down on the number of cases. That probably prevented more cases of hepatitis than the screening did. <laughs> Well, you've indicated uh, that some of your, and I'm quoting your most important research findings were somewhat unexpected, end quote. Can, can you elaborate on that? Well, um, we had no idea, for instance, how many hepatitis viruses uh, there were. As I said, we thought there were, there were two. It turns out that there are at least five. There are five we know about. We think we may have a sixth one now that we're, we're working on uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, so, so those were all uh, unexpected uh, things. Everyone it was a new one. One of the hepatitis viruses uh, that caused big epidemics in Asia was thought to be uh, hepatitis A virus. Used to call it uh, infectious hepatitis virus, uh, but it turned out that was an entirely new virus and hadn't been suspected at all before. So that was that was another unexpected uh, finding. So how many now? You said five, and you're thinking maybe there's a sixth? There are five, and, and we think we may have a sixth one that uh, we're working on now. Well, I was looking at your resume, and, and if I might say <laughs> impressive would be an understatement, but uh, you received more than 40 national and international awards, medals, and other recognition, including uh, National Institutes of Health a Distinguished Investigator, uh, U.S. Public Health Service Distinguished Service Award, King Faisal, International Award, uh, you have more than 45 U.S. patents, published more than 700 papers, and I was looking at all where you'd presented, and I don't know how you had time to research, because you were going all around the world presenting <laughs> yeah, papers. Yeah, traveled a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, you know, so my point is, you know, out of, uh, out of all that, what has brought you the most satisfaction, you know, personal satisfaction in all these contributions that you've made to science and to medicine? Well, I, I think being involved in the one in the discovery of hepatitis viruses and two in uh, developing vaccines against them and seeing the effects of those vaccines because we're not the only ones who have worked on vaccines but we we've, we've contributed to this area of research and and seeing the effect that these vaccines are, are having on populations is tremendously satisfying it's you know it's one of those things that that you can feel I'm really doing something worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard sometimes to, to find things that actually are in that category. Uh, I look at Wall Street uh, and what's going on there in the past year or two. <laughs> I, I would not trade places with them, although I'd trade salaries with them. <laughs> well, it's got to be a, just follow up on your comments, a great personal satisfaction. Of the literally, you probably saved thousands of lives through your research. Well, it's interesting, at least two and possibly three of the hepatitis viruses are also cancer viruses. And uh, two of them, hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus, account for most, I, I think most, of the liver cancer in, mm -hmm. in the world. Alcoholism has its fair share also, but, but basically it's those two viruses. And um, there are between 300 and 350 million people who are chronically infected with hepatitis B virus at the moment and about... How many? 350 300, million? Up to 350 million. Yeah, it's a third of a billion. And um, over 170 million chronically infected with hepatitis C virus. And so uh, certainly with hepatitis B, having the tools at hand to prevent future infections uh, is tremendously satisfying. About 40 percent of those chronically infected with hepatitis B, at least in, in Asia, go on and die of something related to their chronic hepatitis B virus infection. They either die of chronic hepatitis, or they, they die of cirrhosis of the liver, or they die of liver cancer caused by the, the virus. So uh, one of my postdocs some years ago is a prominent uh, 
physician and public health person in Taiwan. He was instrumental in introducing hepatitis B vaccine as a universal pediatric uh, vaccine in Taiwan about 1984, I think it was. And you can already see now not only the, the uh, um, prevalence of infection in the population, which was like about 10 percent of the population chronically infected before us, now down to virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. And they're already beginning to see uh, cancer becoming, uh, liver cancer becoming less frequent in the very young. Uh, the incidence of that disease is diminishing. And so you see this ongoing change in, in the public health in not just one country, but countries all over the world. And, and you know, that's an enormous impact. It really is true that vaccines are one of the most cost-effective medical interventions that you can have, and so it's really exciting to be able to work on them. Well, there's some other examples of uh, scientists who've worked under you and postdocs or studied under you that have gone on and made some significant contributions. Yeah, a number of them have done have done uh, very well. Uh, Jules Deanstag was postdoc who worked under me on hepatitis A, and he went on to become a, a dean for research at Harvard. He's mm -hmm. just stepped out from that post uh, recently. Um, another of the deans at Harvard also was at, at, uh, in our laboratory at the same time. He worked under somebody else in the laboratories. So the laboratories had a, a, a really sterling reputation over the years. What, uh, when you were a young scientist, uh, you know, we, we had this off-camera conversation earlier, but did you ever imagine that you know, you'd make these kinds of medical and scientific contributions you know, in your wildest dreams? Did you ever think that? No, I just enjoyed science. I, didn't, I really didn't think in those terms when I, when I first got into it. I just enjoyed, enjoyed doing, doing things and enjoyed the laboratory and enjoyed finding new things and solving problems. It was just fun. It's fun, but, but let me get on the other side. It's got, I've got to think of all that, the un, unremitting toil, all the hours in the laboratory. I mean, I mean literally all the, 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 the hours and the years of research you put into that. What's, uh, what's kept you going all these years? You're, you're still going strong in your 70s here. In, Type A personality, and, probably. <laughs> and so you, you're not, I'm not suggesting you're a driven personality, but there, there had to be some passion, some, some, something that kept you going all that time. Well, yes, it's just learning, learning new things, and uh, and as I, as I mentioned, solving problems. You you see this problem, and and you want to figure out a way to, to solve it, answer the question, and you answer that one, and then another, <laughs> it ask you another question. So it's just an ongoing sort of thing. And I've worked with, I've worked with all five of the viruses over, over the years, and so it's kind of a constantly changing uh, thing. It's not exactly the same thing all the time. So that keeps, keeps you from getting bored. Did you enjoy teaching? I noticed you've uh, been an adjunct professor at several prestigious universities, including Georgetown, uh, I think, uh, not Harvard, what was some of the others? Johns Hopkins. I was John, John was Hopkins, that's what I was trying to think of. Health, for a number of years I, mm -hmm. I gave lectures uh, yeah. there. Yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed doing that. Uh, I haven't done it for a while. I, it's hard to stay up at the cutting edge of the field and in all those, those various areas. Uh, but I did enjoy it. I enjoyed the students because uh, some of them were really bright and asked good questions. Well, you've perhaps already answered this peripherally, but, but maybe I'll ask it again. Do you have some special memories and highlights of your career? I mean, of all of those recognitions and awards and discoveries, uh, there's, there's been some real highlights for you in, in, in your career. Well, traveling to new places has been a highlight. I enjoy traveling. Um, and because these viruses are much more important in developing countries than they are in industrialized countries, by and large, it's taken me to a lot of really interesting places. And I've seen an opportunity to see a good bit, certainly not all of it, but a good bit of the world, uh, largely through travels related to my work, either attending meetings in these places or being involved in uh, studies, field studies and such in various places. Dr. Purcell, having taught and been in, around so many scientists, uh, any advice for students and aspiring scientists that you'd, you'd give? 
someone's you know, wanting to get into research and medical and scientific research in your areas, what, what advice would you give them? Well, to get the best training they possibly can, mm -hmm. I think, for one thing. Um, as in every other endeavor, there's a fair amount of bad science out there, too. So they need to get into a good laboratory mm -hmm. with first-rate scientists who are critical thinkers and can teach them how to approach a problem um, in the proper way. I think that's very important. I was very lucky to get into the laboratory at, at uh, the National Institutes of Health Laboratory of Infectious Diseases. And I, uh, when I got in that laboratory, uh, it had three National Academy of Sciences members in it at the same time. And, so, and they were all three world-class virologists, and so I had a tremendous opportunity to learn to learn these things in the right way. I think we did mention earlier that you're also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty prestigious. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, sort of following up on that, in the last question, what kinds of skill sets do you see that uh, students uh, here at Oklahoma State University would would need to acquire to be successful researchers? Oh, science has changed so much mm. over the years. It's changed so much in the past five or ten years. They need good uh, mathematical skills and uh, information science skills, something I never had. I <laughs> still don't have. Um, they certainly need to be computer savvy because so much of, of what is done now it, it can only be done with, with uh, sophisticated computers. Um, they also need to keep an open mind and uh, they need to be able to think critically. And they need to keep their head screwed on right, I think, and keep things in perspective. I think people sometimes lose, lose that along the way. Uh, remember what's important and why they're in science to begin with, which I hope in most cases is because they really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You've been back, I guess maybe this is your only been about a day at Oklahoma State, but you had a chance to visit with any of the students here, any of the departments? And yes, finally. I've had uh, several opportunities today to meet with some students and I was extremely impressed. They were really, really good students, very bright. They all have good futures. They already know pretty much where they're going and what they're going to be doing. And any of them hit you up for a job? No, <laughs> I haven't done that. <laughs> What, uh, I know that they're excited about having you back on campus, Dr. Purcell, and, and you, I'm surprised we haven't had you back for a lecture or before. Have they had some conversations with you about coming back, I hope, and staying connected? Yeah, over the years, I think mm -hmm. I've maintained probably not as much connection as I, as I should have, but it's, as you see, I've been busy. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's easy to see. What, uh, kind of two concluding questions then, maybe. What, uh, some special uh, memories that you have of Oklahoma State University of your time here that stand out for you? Some long hours in the library. <laughs> 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 um, I don't know, I enjoyed the campus, the campus life. It wasn't all uh, work here. I enjoyed teaching the chemistry labs here. That was my first opportunity to actually do a little teaching. Mm -hmm. and, I enjoyed that a lot. You must be a pretty good uh, student politician. As you were president of the Arts and Science Student Council, you mentioned. Uh, I think they were hard up for somebody at that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, what <coughs> we've talked about the many things that you've done. Uh, how, you know, looking back at all you've accomplished, you know, your career, uh, people that know you. How do you hope people will remember you? Um. Well, I, I hope some of them at least will um, appreciate what I've what I've done for them as a as a mentor, because uh, I really appreciated what people did for me. It made a big difference in how I ended up and where I, I ended up, just by a few important people taking a little time and pointing me in the right direction. <clears throat> and so I, I hope I've done that for the people who have passed through my laboratory. Kind of looking forward, or are you, you gonna, you gonna keep your work boots on forever, or you, you got, got any uh, uh, 
Well, I'm Keep your personal interest in mind. I'm going to step down as uh, co-lab chief uh, in about another year, mm -hmm. and then I'll stay on for another two or three years, I think, to wind up my work and mm -hmm. close things down, and then I'll be ready to hang up my boots and spurs. <laughs> I remember your spurs being a cowboy. Yeah. You got any hobbies or activities you're looking forward to? Well, uh, despite all the traveling I've done, I enjoy traveling, so I'll probably continue mm -hmm. to do uh, some of that. I enjoy gardening and, and uh, being out, out, out of doors. I'll find ways to keep myself busy, I think. Yeah. Well, I appreciate, the, again, you taking the time to interview with us. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about or bring up or mention that we didn't uh, discuss? No, I think you did a pretty thorough job of going through my, <laughs> my CV bibliography. No, it would have taken a lot more time <laughs> to have gone through all your bibliography, but, uh, but uh, just on our behalf, we want to tell you we're, we're proud of you as an well, alumnus of Oklahoma State University. Again, congratulations on your recognition from the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>